Hello. Um, this is now my third or fourth <laughs> attempt at making this video. Um, unfortunately, I, my computer just doesn't work in the heat. And I think that there's something weird going on with Zoom. But regardless, I'm, I'm taking an attempt here in my office um, because there's air conditioning here. <laughs> um, so, you know, you'll, you'll notice I'm not in my backyard or in my dining room. Um, my office is, uh, like looking at this little video of me in my office, it's like, oh yeah, my office totally captures my personality. It's super colorful and there's crap everywhere and it's like, it's a hot mess. Anyway, um, so hopefully this will be quiet and peaceful. There definitely won't be any dogs jumping on me. Um, and, um, yeah, so we can talk about the last part of macroevolution that I've been trying to talk to you guys about for, you know, several days. Um, so the last section of this chapter is dealing with um, classification and um, phylogenetics, which are it's a fancy name for evolutionary relationships. Okay, so let me write that word phylogenetics. Oh come on, pen. Okay. Okay, so what do these two things have to do with each other? So classification is exactly what it sounds like. It basically means like naming. So when we're talking about classification in biology, we're talking about how we name or categorize different organisms. Um, we've actually started talking about this in the video that went with um, the first organism of the day week. <laughs> I keep saying that. It used to be organism of the day. And it takes me a long time to learn new habits. <laughs> so it is now called organism of the week, but I can't ever remember to say that. So, um, and already there's beeping, so I'm going to have to pause. So I'll be right back. Sorry, there's a control panel right outside of my office that um, basically like makes these obnoxious alert noises all the time for all different buildings on campus. So like, I just got notification that there's something going on at the you know Center for the Arts. Um, as far as I can tell, the notifications don't mean anything substantial. <laughs> um, so it's irritating. Anyway, classification. Okay, so classification is the way that we name things. And we started talking about this with Organism of the Week. So, in that video, if you didn't watch that video, you probably should. Okay, so Organism of the Week, I talked a little bit about um, the different domains. Um, and then within domain Eukarya, we talked a little bit about the kingdoms there. Okay, and so um, refer back to that if you need a reminder or you need clarification, because I just, I don't want to waste your time by going through the whole, you know, rigmarole again okay um so what do i want to say about that um so phylogenetics is a way of carefully sort of reconstructing um evolutionary relationships looking how different organisms are related to each other and you know over the over the period of time right um and so this first phylogenetic tree that we are looking at here um is a really big tree because it really big meaning it includes lots of organisms not that the tree itself is large because it actually doesn't have very many branches at all okay um but the idea is that um this phylogen phylogenetic tree covers all of life okay so phylogenetic trees um, remind me a lot of like a flow chart kind of essentially. Okay. Um, and so notice how they're, how this is organized. So we're just going to kind of walk our way through it. So this particular tree is oriented in a left to right arrangement. Sometimes they're arranged from bottom to top. So it's either left to right or bottom to top. It, it, that people show them different ways for for a variety of reasons, right? It's just, you know, they, they essentially mean the same thing. It's just sometimes it looks better one way or the other, depending on what you're trying to show, okay? All right, so 
um, Bic here, right? It's like life, everything that's alive is on this tree. Okay. So everything that is alive, according to um, cell theory anyway, everything that is alive is made up of cells. And those cells are either prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells. And I'm going to refer you back to Organism of the Week video, right? Organism of the Week one, um, to have reminders for that if you need it. Okay. Of the organisms that have prokaryotic cells, they fit into two domains, either domain bacteria or domain archaea. I talked, I think, a tiny bit in that video about the differences between the two. We're not going to really worry about it too much. Um, I might talk about it a little bit later. For now, we're not going to make a distinction between the two, okay, other than to just say that those two, two domains are both um, composed of prokaryotic cells. Okay, and you, like I said, you'll review what that means if something is made of prokaryotic cells. Okay, domain eukarya is made of eukaryotic cells. And so there are three major kingdoms, and then there's a bunch of little smaller kingdoms that we've kind of clunked to get clunked, clumped together to call the protists. Um, so the, the three biggies. Kingdom plantae, kingdom fungi, kingdom animalia, um, and there's a little description of each one of those, um, are very um, sort of distinct and well established. Um, then there's all these small kingdoms that collectively we sometimes refer to as the protists. It's kind of lazy. Um, <laughs> but the reason people do that is essentially it's kind of like, well, and then there's all these weirdos and we're just going to stick all the weirdos together. So those weirdos actually are a very diverse, um, collection of different organisms, but they just kind of, it's like, well, it's not a plant, a fungus or an animal, you know, so we're just going to kind of pile them up over there. So it's kind of sloppy, but anyway. Um, so protist is not a kingdom, right? Po protist is a term that's used to describe basically any eukaryote that doesn't fit into one of those kingdoms. So there are multiple kingdoms within the protists, the group that we call the protists. Okay. So this shouldn't be new, right? This should be, you should be looking at this and being like, yeah, okay, pretty much other than the, the tree organization. All right. As far as the different organisms, this shouldn't be new um, because organism of the week. Okay, so what are we going to be talking about here? So a couple things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about um, how organisms are organized. We're going to talk about how organisms are named, right? And then we're going to talk about some of, some of the kind of tricky things to know about the structure of phylogenetic trees, okay? So first we're going to start with basically simple classification. So classification is um it's just naming right so it's putting organisms into groups based on um you know different traits that they have right and the the different groups come in different sizes and what i mean by that is groups can be super inclusive meaning they include a lot of different organisms or groups can be extraordinarily specific okay so we're going to go from big or most inclusive down to small or least inclusive, okay? Um, and so this is that little, excuse me. This is that little treat. I just got like an air bowl. Um, classy videos, that's me. Um, <laughs> this, um, that's the, the tree that's, that was on that last slide. Anyway, okay. So the text on this may very well be too small for you to read, particularly depending on, you know, what kind of device you're looking at this. But it, it is in your computer. So you can, you know, if you need to, you can absolutely look at it there. So we already know what domains are, right? Domains are, there are three domains, only three domains. But you like my temporary tattoos? My daughter, she got me before I left the house. She attacked me. Anyway, um, it's better than stickers. That's the other thing that I get all over my face. Um, okay, so we already talked about domains. There are three domains, right? Everything that's alive fits into one of those three domains, okay? Um, so that's the, the most inclusive or the largest group, all right? And so this is showing a few selected examples within domain eukarya, right? So there's eukarya. And, you know, so they have a tiger, a lion, a cat, a bear, a kangaroo, a snake, a beetle, and a strawberry plant, okay? 
All right, below the domain, I'm just writing the initials here so you can keep track, um, are kingdoms, right? Already talked about that. So in this particular example, they are focusing on kingdom animalia, right? And so <laughs> our strawberry plant got kicked out because strawberries are not, in fact, animals. So they got kicked out. Okay. All right. So those two groupings you're familiar with. Um, below that, though, these are new. Okay. So the next one is called a phylum. So in this particular example, our target organism that we're ultimately focusing on, obviously, is a tiger, okay? And so um, the specific phylum that the tiger is in is in phylum chordata. You don't need to memorize that. That's not really, that's not something that I care so much. Like, I don't care that you know, oh, this is called chordata. But I do care that you understand that this is smaller than a kingdom, right? So it's a specific group of animals, but it's kind of, you know, it's kind of somewhere in the middle as far as size, okay? So phylum chordata includes any animal that has a backbone. So we lose our beetle because insects don't have backbones, okay? So he's not included anymore, but all the rest of them, right? The tiger, the lion, the cat, the bear, the kangaroo, and the snake are all still there because all of those organisms have a backbone, okay? After phylum, we have class. All right, so the class, so chordata, right? And then the class that we're focusing on, focusing on in this particular example are the mammals, class mammalia. Um, I suspect you probably have a good handle on what makes a mammal. If you don't, that's okay. We're, you're gonna kind of figure that out as we go through our organisms of the week, I think, hopefully. Um, Basically, um, what constitutes, uh, what are the unique characteristics of mammals? Mammals have hair or fur. Mammals have mammary glands. Mammals, um, the vast majority of mammals, not all of them, have um, gestation, right? So they, they're young or born, right? Um, so as opposed to hatched. Yeah? Okay. So, um, so those are mammals, right? So cool. So who did we lose? Well, we lost our snake. No hair. No mammary glands. They're egg layers, okay? So they're out. So see how the group, it's getting like more and more specific as we go, less and less inclusive, it includes fewer and fewer organisms. Okay, after mammalia, right? That was our class. We're going down to order carnivora. Okay, so order. So the carnivores, um, you're probably familiar with that term, right? Um, carnivora are animals that eat meat. <laughs> right? So who did we lose? We still have our tiger. We still have our lion. We still have our kitty cat. We still have our bear. We lost our kangaroo. Kangaroos essentially are, um, or they're larger before. They're like, they're like deer that jump. Um, so definitely not in order carnivora, okay? Um, getting smaller. Now we're into family, and the family in this particular example family is felidae. Those are the felines or the cats. So who do we lose? We lose, we lose bears, right? Because now, you know, bears aren't cats, right? So we got our tiger, our lion, and our kitty cat, our domestic cat. Okay, getting smaller still. Now we're in a category called a genus. So I'm going to spell the words that are kind of tricky. So phylum might be tricky. Class, order, family are spelled how you'd expect. Domain, you already know. Genus, it's not the same as genius. It doesn't have an I in it. So it's G-E-N-U-S. Um, so genus is the next to smallest group. Um, and so we're getting even more specific. And so the specific genus that we're looking at in this example is Panthera, which is the genus that includes all of the large cats. So who do we lose? We lost our domestic kitty cat, okay? So even though your house cat is in the same family as a tiger, it's not in the same genus as a tiger anymore. They're in a different genus, okay? Um, so genus panthera are all of the big cats. So, you know, lions and um, tigers and um, a couple others too. I don't think, I can't remember if all leopards are in there or not, right? So anyway, whatever, it doesn't matter, okay? All right. The smallest group, according to this classification, is a species, right? So 
hierarchy. Oh, I gotta move my. You guys can't see these in the recording, but there's these stupid bars. Of gotta move them before I can write. Okay, so big to small. All right, so hierarchy of classification. Dun, 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 dun. Let's put that back. All right, so um, so the smallest group or species. And in the last video, we took the time to try to define what a species is. But remember, the biological species concept, the, the definition that we use most of the time has its problems, right? So if you don't recall that, go back and watch that video again, because we talked about how the biological species concept works really well for most animals, but there's other groups that it does not work well for. Okay. So in species, you have only tigers. Okay. So the scientific name for any critter, basically when we talk about the scientific name, we, we sometimes refer to this as binomial nomenclature. That's what it says over here. Um, because the name that we use includes two parts. It includes the genus and it includes, so genus and also the species. Okay. Um, so the scientific name for our tiger is Panthera tigris. And so the reason that we have two names is because you want to say who, what genus it's in, because then you have an idea of like who the closest relatives are, right? So Panthera tells you right away, oh, we're talking about one of the big cats, right? And then the tigris is the specific big cat, if that makes sense. Now, you'll notice when you look at this example that there's a specific way that we write scientific names. We always capitalize the first letter of the genus, Everything else is lowercase. It's always going to be two words like that. Sometimes we, if, if it's a name that we use a lot, so like um, there's a particular bacteria called E. coli. We call it E. coli because everybody knows what you're talking about. So we don't use the whole genus name. It's like Escheria or something. It's a long name. Um, and so everybody's just like, whatever, E. coli. We all know what that means. So sometimes you'll see the first, the genus abbreviated, but not all the time. Okay. Um, so what was I about to say? Right. So everything else is lowercase. First letter of the genus is capital. Um, and if it's typed, it's always in italics, or at least it should be in italics, um, because um, you want to have that distinction so that people know this is a scientific name as opposed to just a common name. Why don't we just use common names? There's several reasons. One, common names um, are subject to all kinds of, you know, confusing language differences and confusing um, cultural differences and regional differences that are not an issue with scientific names. So everyone is in agreement about scientific names. They're standard no matter what language you speak. So if you wanted to, you know, talk about tigers in Japan, you would use the same name right? If you are in a, you know, working in a scientific context. Okay. Um, why is that so important? So my favorite example is, um, so I have been in California for a long time, but I, you know, migrated West as a child, right? So when I was um, a kid, um, there was a particular organism that lived in my backyard that I called a potato bug, because that's what all my friends called it. They called it a potato bug. Um, when I talk about potato bugs here, I realized they're not talking about the same thing that I'm talking about. Because when I talk about a potato bug in my head, I'm talking about those little guys that are kind of gray and they roll up into little balls. People here generally call them roly polies. Okay. Um, but in Pennsylvania, we call them potato bugs. Okay. Same thing. It's just a different name. It's a regional thing. Okay. Um, what people here call potato bugs are a totally different type of insect. They're um, this thing that looks like a cricket kind of. Um, and some people, there's a lot of like mythology associated with them being um, like from hell because they dig underground. And so people are like afraid of them, but they're completely harmless. And anyway, but they're ugly. Um, and so, so, you know, if I'm talking about a potato bug, you know, and like, oh, we're going to, we're going to use potato bugs in lab today because we want to learn about how they respond to different stimuli. Some people will be like, oh God, that's gross. But most of you probably wouldn't be too freaked out about 
you know, playing with a roly poly, right, in lab. So anyway, so you get the idea. Um, so that's why scientific names are important. Okay. So for the most part, we're pretty casual about using common names in here, but I want you to identify and I want you to know how to write a scientific name when necessary. Okay. All right, so the other kind of deal with the hierarchy of classification is I do want you to memorize which groups are the biggest and which groups are smallest in order. And so when I was a kid, um, domains were actually like new, not when I was a kid, when I was in college. Um, so they were like a new thing, um, which brings me to another point, which is really interesting. And that is that classification constantly changes. Um, and this is true of it should be true of all science, but it's especially true with biology, is that we, when we learn new things, we change and respond to those changes, right? Because it's all about, you know, finding the truth, right? Finding information. And so if you gather evidence that says that, oh, it's, you know, something that you thought was true, it turns out it's not, right? You change, okay? Um, so classification changes all the time. I cannot tell you. There are certain groups, I've, I've now lived long enough, there are certain groups that were one thing and then they changed to something else and then they changed back to the thing they were before. So now I'm like, I don't even care. I don't, <laughs> I don't care what we call that. It's just, it is what it is. Um, so you might notice that happening. But anyway, to get back to my original point, which was you need to know big to small. When I was a student, the mnemonic device that we used to learn this was kings play chess on fine green silk. Um, mnemonic devices are usually very um, like visual so that you, so they're easy to remember. Okay, and so that should be pretty easy to remember, right? You can sort of imagine, and, and honestly, whenever I'm doing this, still, there's a grown ass lady, right? When I'm going through and I'm thinking about, okay, wait, which one's bigger, a class or an order? I always go, right? Like, yeah. So, um, kings play chess on fine green silk. And so I can visualize two kings playing chess with each other, and the um, uh, chess board is made of green silk. Okay. Um, if you don't like that one, um, there's, you can make up your own. There's, um, all kinds of other ones that exist. Um, there's even ones that are a little bit dirty. So I actually, actually learned this one from a student. Um, dirty, kinky people can often find great sex. There's one. Okay. Um, and then my favorite one, I had some students one time invent their own and my favorite that they invented was um, dumb kids playing checkers on freeways get squashed. I like that one. Anyway. Okay. So learn it. All right. So what are we looking at? So now let's kind of talk about um, how these phylogenetic trees are constructed and um, a little bit about how they work. So remember, this was one that, that is kind of oriented from left to right. This is an example of one that's oriented from bottom to top. Um, in both of them, whether it's shown or whether it's just implied, there's a time scale, right? So older to newer, okay? So in this one, the time scale, right? Older to newer. Okay, um, this one is the branches of the tree. Instead of looking like, you know, forks in the road, they look like brackets, but they essentially tell you the same thing as this one that just uses like more direct forks. So it doesn't matter. It, they, they tell the same kind of information, you know, regardless. It's just kind of different reasons why you would use the two, but we're not going to do enough of these that that's going to be like a huge issue. Okay, that said, this is going to be really important for um, one of the lab activities we're doing um, called the WIPO lab. Just saying, WIPO. So when you do that lab, you might want to watch this video again. Okay, all right, so tree. All right, some things you need to know about the tree. Um, the closer 
two groups are to where they connect, where the two branches connect, the more closely related to each other they are. So rats and mice are more closely related to each other than either of those are to humans. Okay, let's go back and look at this big one for a second, right? So um, animals and fungi are more closely related to each other than animals are to bacteria because animals and fungi share a common ancestor here, but animals and bacteria share a common ancestor back there. Okay, so, right, so that's how you read the table. Um, with these trees, you can always spin around these nodes and it doesn't change the meaning of the, um, of the tree at all, right? So whether it's, you know, mice, mice here and rats here or vice versa, it, it doesn't matter. It tells you the same thing, right? Still mice and rats are more closely related to each other than they are to a human, right? And down here, in fact, they're spinning around this node, right? So they're spinning around that node. Um, and so the tree looks a little different, you know, just in that, like you have to look at it more carefully, but it still, once again, is telling you the same story. The mouse and the rat are most closely related to each other, so they share a common ancestor at that node. Um, and then their closest relative of the ones that are shown here after that is a human, and then the bird is there and the fish is there, right? So they kind of tell you, um, you know, it's, it's all about re relationships, how closely related different groups are, okay? How do we make a tree like this? Um, there's a couple different ways. The old OG way, like the old school way of doing it that still is used, right, and is used often actually, is by looking at comparative anatomy. So we talked about what comparative anatomy is in the last video, but basically we're essentially making a list of different anatomical features within a group of different organisms and kind of like putting them together based on what they have in common. Okay, so the four animals that we chose to look at for this are, you know, we, meaning you, the textbook author from a different textbook than what you're using, um, chose a lion, a hyena, a black bear, and a gray wolf, okay? And what characteristics did they look at? Well, they chose to look at characteristics that allow us to put them into groups. So they didn't pick fur because all of them have fur, so that doesn't help you separate them into smaller groups, okay? Um, right? They all have four legs, so we're not going to use that characteristic because that doesn't help you make them into smaller groups, right? So what did they choose to look at? So one of them is retractable claws. So if you have a cat and you play with their little, little paws, right? Cats are really cool because they have this ability to like curl their, the tips of their fingers back like this, essentially like putting their claws away, right? And then when they want to, they put them out, right? They stick them out. Okay. Um, and so they have this like funny little joint in the tip of their finger that allows them to do that. Okay. That is a characteristic that is not found in all carnivores, right? It's only found in cats and their relatives. So look at that, right? Lions and hyenas both have the ability to retract their claws, which is kind of handy because then you, you know, can have your claws out when you need them for grip or to attack somebody or something like that. But you can also put them away when they're, you know, when they could potentially get in trouble. Okay, so that's kind of a handy little trick. Um, none of the dog species, including wolves, have this. Bears don't, right? Their claws are already out. So this is why your dog, when they jump on you, they scratch you, right? Even if they don't mean to because they can't put their claws away like your cat can. If your cat scratches you, they're doing it on purpose, <laughs> right? If your dog scratches you, they might be on purpose, but it might be an accident. They can't put their claws away, okay? All right, and then they looked at some, you know, chambers in the ear bone. And then, you know, the most entertaining of the three different characteristics is they, they asked the question, does the penis have a bone? So um, it is fairly common in a variety of mammals to actually have a penis inside of their bone. Um, so the word boner <laughs> actually, actually comes from something, but I will tell you that humans do not have a penis bone. So. Speaking of which, it's actually kind of convenient that I'm here in my office instead of at home because in my pen cup, which has a very cute fake poppy pen in it, I happen to have a penis bone. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys are 
like your families are probably like, what is wrong with your teacher? Okay, so this is from a coyote and it's got ink on it because it's been in my pen cup, right? But anyway, that's a penis bone, okay? It's kind of a funny little shape, actually. It's kind of cool, right? So that's what they look like. And they come in all different sizes depending on what kind of mammal it is. You should see a walrus one. It's amazing. We happen to have one in the lab. I'm not going to go get it. But, you know, once uh, Corona is done, come visit me and I'll, I'll show you the walrus penis bone. Anyway, um, I'm so juvenile. I'm like a, I'm like a 12-year-old boy. Okay, uh, <laughs> so do they have a penis bone or not? Cats don't, so no. These guys do, so yes, right? And so what they decided is by looking at these characteristics, well, probably given the, you know, that they share more similarities, the black bear and the gray wolf are actually more closely related to each other and the African lion and the spotted hyena are more closely related to each other right so that's how you make a phylogenetic tree which is um, like I said something you're going to be doing in the WIPO lab okay if not this week next week depends on when you're watching this video okay um, we have had trees forever <laughs> right for you know for a long time that use characteristics like this okay um only recently and by recently i mean in the last you know 20 30 years we've been able to now um look at dna sequences much more efficiently and so we've been able to actually compare dna sequences in genes between different organisms okay and so this is an example of a tree that's comparing dna sequences so you don't know that much about dna yet which is fine so you don't need to worry about like, I don't understand what the colors mean and why is it that, right? The idea is that if two organisms are more closely related, you would expect them to have a more similar DNA sequence, right? So anyway, okay? So, um, so that's that, all right? So trees are made a variety of different ways. Most of the time, the trees that we produced using anatomical characteristics, um, match up pretty well with the trees that are created with DNA. But there's actually some weird things that we've discovered, right? So DNA sequencing has helped us understand that, you know, there's some stuff that we had in the wrong group, <laughs> right? And so that's kind of interesting, all right? Science always changes, okay? You learn more, you change, right? Okay, so this little diagram, I like this one because it sort of shows you the relationship between that classification and a phylogenetic tree, right? So this one happens to be a left to right tree as opposed to a bottom to top tree. Um, but then they use different colored blocks to kind of show you, you know, the different um, groupings. So the species, I'm going from right to left, the species, the genus, the family, the order. So all of these animals that are listed here are all carnivores. They're all in carnivora, okay? Oh yeah, leopards are panthera. <laughs> They're also one of the considered to be in the same genus as um, lions and tigers. What was I saying? Sorry. Okay, so, um, okay, so of these five carnivores, the leopard, the skunk, the otter, the coyote, the wolf, of these five critters, which two are most closely related to each other? And how do you know? Well, it's coyotes and wolves. And you know that for two reasons. One, because they're in the same genus. They're both in genus Canis. So that implies that they're pretty closely related to each other. But the other reason that you know is, look, this is where their shared ancestor is. That's where their common ancestor is, right? So they're, they, remember, there's an implied scale of time, right? So long ago versus recent, right? So the idea is that coyotes and wolves shared a common ancestor fairly recently compared to the other groups. Okay, all right, which two species are next most closely related to each other? All right, well, if we look at our skunk and our otter, they're not in the same genus. They're in, they're in two different genera. That's plural for genus. I know it's weird, all right? So Mephitis and Lutra are the two different genera. Um, so their common ancestors back here, 
but they're both in the same family. Okay. All right. And then our leopard over here of the five, the leopard is the one that's least closely related to the others because not only is a leopard in a different genus than the others, but also in a different family. Right. And as it turns out, actually, the canids and the mustelids are more closely related to each other than either one is to the felids. Right. So what that, what does that mean to you? That means that your dog is more closely related to a skunk than it is to your cat. That's interesting. Huh. Yeah. Okay, that's what this is telling you, all right? So, anyway, okay? So that's a tree that, you know, kind of shows the relationship between those two. Sometimes we screw things up with classification. So phylogenetic trees are always more accurate than classification because classification people, <laughs> there's a problem with humans in that we get used to something and then we don't want to change it. <laughs> it's like, but, uh -huh, but I learned it is that name. I don't want to change it. Right, and so even though we should sometimes, there's, you know, there's often a little bit of resistance. So sometimes classification is wonky. All right, and then there's, you know, there's a few more examples in here. Um, this might be something that we talk about in um, a Zoom session, if y'all want to, right? If you're having a hard time um, sort of understanding what a phylogenetic tree is, or if you're thinking to yourself, well, so what characteristics did they look at to put these, you know, critters in these different branches, right? We could totally do, you know, an exercise where we sit and go, okay, let's make a little table of characteristics and, you know, go through and talk about it. That would be, that would actually be pretty fun, I think, right? So, um, so, you know, if you want to do that, come to a Zoom and we'll, we'll do that. Okay, um, probably later in the week instead of early in the week, because earlier in the week nobody has ever watched any of the lectures yet. <laughs> okay, um, anyway, and that's where we're going to stop for this video. So the rest of the PowerPoint is actually for next week. So I left it in here because it's super short, and I was like, I don't want to make a separate PowerPoint for this. It's just, uh -huh. So we're going to talk about the origin of life next week, um, but the slides are in here. Okay, so that's it for this, and hopefully. Zoom isn't going to screw me over this time. If this one doesn't actually get recorded, I'm going to be, I'm going to lose my mind, just so you know. Okay. All right. Um, have a good week.